Thanks, Lori. Uh, as Lori said, I'm Mike Dunning from the U.S. Department of Transportation Volpe Center, and I, I'm one of the co-authors on TCRP Report 177, the Preliminary Strategic Analysis of Next Generation Fair Payment Systems for Public Transportation. The primary author of Report uh, 177 was Eric Wallacecheck, and we collaborated with Eric uh, along with uh, Tim Weisenberger and Andy Bertome, who has joined me here for the questions and answers. If you think about next generation payment systems, all of you who are th planning and implementing payment systems have a chance to have a very, very positive impact on everybody who takes transit in your region. So what we're going to, Polly and I are going to describe today many options for payment systems, and these make it easier for people to travel throughout your region, more convenient, and you're literally going to have a chance to increase people's mobility. You'll also be able to make payment systems and the payment process more efficient for your agencies, and you may be able to enable new fare collection and pricing policies to help manage travel demand in your region. When we saw the number of people signed up for this webinar, uh, I, I at first thought that you must have seen the title Next Generation and thought this had something to do with Star Trek. Uh, that's probably not what you're going to get. Uh, we are going to talk about next generation. It's not Star Trek technology. What we mean by next generation payment systems is technology that can improve your agency's operations, really making it easier for people to travel, enhancing their experience. But we're taking a very uh, aspirational view of, of what next generation means because we're trying to make the description in, in TCRP Report 177 something that could apply to virtually every transit system. So this isn't just those of you on the very cutting edge. We're, we're trying to present options to you that you can use to just make an improvement over what you have now. And if you look at the slide on the screen now, uh, we've got figures right out of the report. Figure 2.1 is the one showing. And what that depicts is that your fare payment system design has to be aligned with several factors, with your agency fare program itself, with your regional goals for transportation and payment systems, uh, and with the overall payment system design topology. The alignment with your goals is, is probably one of the most important things you can do because there are a lot of different reasons you might be considering payment system technology. Uh, your agency might be looking to reduce the cost of fare collection by eliminating cash or reducing the issuance of, of fare media. Uh, you may be trying to make things easier for people to ride your system or your your ride across various systems in your region, or you may be trying, you may be in need of new technologies because your your old systems are nearing the end of their useful life, and you want to get refresh your technologies and actually future proof them. So there there are lots of reasons you'd be doing this, and those goals can really drive the choices you make in payment systems. Our report outlines uh, gives you a, a very uh, fundamental background on what the payment systems options are. So we don't assume you know anything about payment systems technology to appreciate uh, Report 177. We outline uh, the major technologies used in transit payment, starting with contactless smart cards, uh, which as, as many of you know have been implemented by over two dozen transit systems in North America. Uh, this is an extremely convenient form of payment because it is contactless. It's very quick. The rider just has to tap the contactless card on a reader or validator. Uh, in most of the systems today, the value has been stored on that card in what we call a card-based system, but some of the, the newer systems emerging uh, use the card as an identifier and it points to an account in the back office. The other kind of technology that's become very popular in the last few years is mo mobile ticketing and mobile payments. 
and you see two pictures on the screen here of types of mobile payments. Uh, or mobile ticking, I should say. Uh, one, a graphic that's often animated, and the other, uh, a barcode. So these are cases where you're, you're turning your mobile device in, into uh, a flash pass or, or a proof of payment. The other type of technology that we discuss in the report, and you have as an option, are contactless payment cards that could be issued by others. So these are cards that are issued not by the transit authority itself, but by a third party. And many of you may have heard about the move uh, in some parts of the transit industry to open systems. And an open system will now enable you to uh, accept for payment cards issued by other organizations. Like on the left, you see a card issued by a financial uh, institution could be a bank or a credit card company. Now those cards have been very, very popular in places like London, uh, in Canada, and in other parts of the world where contactless financial cards are prevalent. Here in the United States, uh, we had some issuance of contactless bank cards several years ago, uh, but the, recently the banks haven't been issuing uh, very many of them, so that's not hasn't been had, had the uptake that uh, people were hoping for. Uh, on the right, you see another type of payment card, and this is a general purpose reloadable card. Um, these are can be issued by other third parties um, other than financial institutions, and they're usually sold at retail stores. So it makes the distribution of the card very very easy. Uh, the card you see there is from Salt Lake City, and other transit systems like Chicago Transit Authority have, have also issued this kind of card. Now, the other type of mobile payments that's emerging is uh, usually what we call mobile wallets. And in this case, you have a mobile app on your mobile smartphone. Uh, it could, could be something like Apple Pay, Google Pay, or one of the payment wallets issued by credit card companies. And there, you're essentially using your smart, uh, your mobile device as in the same way you would use a contactless uh, bank card. So the, the financial, the payment application is resident right on your card, and your phone has what we call near-field communications capabilities to act just like a contactless card, uh, and, and you just tap it, pass it by the reader and it interacts with that payment application. So this isn't something that's been used very much, but uh, contactless payment devices have been deployed uh, in, in many places in retail outlets and in many of the newer transit payment systems, and many systems expect this to be more prevalent in the future. So the, we outline different kinds of design attributes in the report that need to be considered when you're selecting your the type of fare system and the media that you're going to be using. You have to think about the scope of your program. Are you doing this just for a single agency or are you going in on it with others uh, for a multi-agency system like Polly's going to be talking about in a few minutes? Is your design based on proprietary technology? It only accepts the, the types of cards or devices that, that are uh, made by the vendor you're working with? Or is it a more standards-based technology architecture where you can plug and play different uh, vendors' technologies? Is you can have a, a payment system that's card-based, as I was saying before, that where the value is based, stored on the card, or more account-based. Uh, Account-based payment systems are pretty much like toll systems where your card or your mobile device is just a pointer to an account in the back office. And as I mentioned, your architecture can be either a closed system where you're accepting only payment media that you issue or an open system where you also accept payment media issued by financial institutions or, or other, other types of organizations. Now, in our report, what, one of the things we were trying to do is show how all these different factors could come together in what we call a payment system topology. I've got a graphic on the screen from the report 
which uh, just shows how we break down each of those four factors that I just mentioned. And when we, we give a lot of case studies in the report of uh, payment systems that have been implemented around the, the North America, the United States, and in each one of those we categorize the payment system topology using this, this, uh, this, this configuration. Now, for one of the first examples we have is of a smaller transit agency, the Whatcom Agent Transit System in Bellingham, Washington, north of Seattle. And as you can see here, this is what we call a single agency proprietary card-based closed system. In, in Bellingham, they needed to replace their, uh, their fare collection equipment, their fare box on the buses. So they had to get a system that the vendor, where the vendor could supply the equipment and all the other parts of the fare system. They found that the proprietary card-based closed system had what they needed and it was relatively easy for them to implement this kind of a system. Another example we have is one that's uh, common in many parts of the world, and this is a multi-agency version of that proprietary card-based closed system. A good example of that is the Clipper card system in the San Francisco Bay Area. As many of you know, the Clipper card is accepted at, at, at least 20 different transit agencies throughout the San Francisco Bay Area, and they also accept it for some transit parking. Now this is, uh, makes things very, very convenient for riders. They can use their Clipper card throughout the region, but it was fairly complex to engineer and design that system because all the fair agency rules from all those different agencies had to be reflected in the what we call the fare engine calculations on the back end. Now another type of system that many ag agencies are moving towards now is an account-based open payment design. And here you can have one or more agencies uh, adopting the system. It's almost always based on different design standards to allow you to use different vendors' technologies, and it's account-based. So in this, this type of system, you establish customer accounts which are managed in the back office. You keep the customer's data, the balance of their, in, in their account, not on your payment media. So as I said, it's sort of like having a toll account where you can use any kind of payment media uh, and decrement your account. Example of that, in fact, the first open and account-based transit system um, payment system here in the United States is at Utah Transit. So it, that's a single agency system, but it's standards-based and it's an account-based system. They have a close, they accept a wide variety of, of media for payment on, on their buses and rail, uh, both light rail and commuter rail. They accept the prepaid card that uh, I was showing you before, but they also set, accept cards issued by lots of other different types of organizations. They'll accept a financial, contactless financial uh, bank or credit card company card. Uh, over half of their riders are in employer and university accounts. So if that organization has a contactless smart card for their their employer and university ID, that can be used to access transit and it's just linked up with their account. Now, in addition to the existing technologies that are in use throughout uh, the United States, North America, and other parts of the world, uh, we did explore some of the emerging technologies. Uh, there are different way, things that are, that are being uh, demonstrated and, and tested throughout the world. And some of, two of the, the methods that I've shown here on the screen are using devices where the, they automatically sense the customer in or around the transit vehicle and interact with them in, rather than uh, the customer tapping their card or their device on a device, on a reader or validator. So some of those could use Bluetooth technologies that's built into your smartphone or, or other smart device. And others uh, have a, a different kind of architecture 
Um, they've been tested as what's called a be in, be out concept, um, tested in, in Dresden, Germany, and a couple other places around the world. And the idea here was that if you had a compatible device, you would just get board the transit vehicle. It would automatically be able to tell you were on, on and charge you for the ride. So those kind of technologies are being demonstrated in testing uh, at this point and may become more prevalent in the future. And finally, um, as most of you know, that in virtually every part of the country, we're developing new types of mobility uh, to complement transit services. So we have a whole variety of mobility options travelers can choose from now, bike share, ride share, car sharing, uh, ride sourcing, ride hailing, uh, mobile parking. Just we we're finding that travelers want to want seamless, easy, convenient ways to travel on any kind of uh, mobility service. Uh, now, what we we as most of you have probably actually experienced, there are many many trip multimodal trip planners emerging where you can plan uh, a trip using virtually any one of these mobility services. And what we see uh, coming now are linkages between your trip planning and booking applications on your smart device with payment. So there are many places around the country that are now linking up your planning, booking, and payment systems. And I've listed four of the ways uh, that's being done around the country, either using the same kind of card, some places are using the same smart card for transit and car sharing or, or bike sharing. Uh, they're linking their mobile apps, or they're linking their accounts from the back office. And other transit systems are co-marketing with some of these mobility services, like co-marketing with a ride-hailing company and giving different incentives, uh, like discounts if you take uh, transit and, and one of the other services. So there's a, there's a big move towards what we call multimodal payments convergence. Uh, the Secure Technology Alliance just uh, released a white paper on this topic that you can get on, on their website. Well, we tried in, in the report 177, we then tried to roll all that information that I was just describing together and show how those different topologies can be aligned with your goals uh, and different kinds of fair media and how well they can uh, position you to be uh, ready to go to a multi-agency system or even a multimodal system. We also outlined lots of opportunities you have to interact with other people that are thinking about exactly this kind of issue. The APTA Fair Collection and Revenue Management Conference is one of those venues. Uh, TRV and ITS America are another. I mentioned the Secure Technology Alliance Transportation Council is a very active group in payments and transportation. And finally, the Federal Transit Administration, USDOT, has a Mobility on Demand Sandbox program where 11 different demonstrations are underway and several of those involve future payment systems. So our TCRP report also tries to give you some real examples of people doing innovative things in payment. And we've listed five of them here. Uh, they include five different types of examples, one RFP uh, or excerpts from a request for proposal, uh, one concept of operation, a white paper, a request for information, and some specifications. So I think by looking at what other systems are, have done and some of the examples that they've already put together, you all can benefit quite a bit from, from what's going on. And this will give you an idea of who else you, you may want to network with in the future. So that concludes what uh, I wanted to do, tell you about with the, the effort that we did for TCRP. And now to give you a whole lot more information about what the opportunities are of, uh, for payments, tra payment systems in, transport, in transit, particularly as you think about uh, partnering with other transit agencies, uh, Polly Okunyuk is going to describe their TCRP effort. Polly is going to tell you about the options, the opportunities, the challenges um, that she discussed in a uh, fair amount more detail. So Polly, it's all yours. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Polly Okunyuk. I um, uh, 
wrote, authored the uh, TCRP synthesis report number 125. Those of you who are familiar with the type that uh, uh, the Transportation Research Board produces, a uh, synthesis is really a state of the practice. So we just report on what other, what organizations tell us they do uh, without giving, without trying to analyze them or uh, identify reasons why things uh, occur as they are. Um, but first, I wanted to describe what a multi-agency electronic payment system is. Uh, it's characterized by multiple transit agencies. We were given, uh, usually on the uh, CPRP reports, there's a panel of industry experts who direct us uh, to address some kind of research question. Um, and so the multi-agency, they wanted us to look primarily at transit with multiple modes. Um, we also looked at electronic payments. Uh, that includes the smart cards, contact lists, and, and others, uh, as well as non-cash payments that may include uh, mobile payments or uh, other kinds of uh, non-cash payments. Um, and then we looked at the system aspects, which uh, aligned with uh, card versus the company, that is local versus centralized in the back office, the services and functions associated with that, as well as the data reporting uh, systems that are associated with these payment systems. Uh, so the report, uh, I'm only going to cover uh, uh, several of the topics that were covered in the report. Some of the, the uh, introductions to came in to media and fair structure were covered by Mike. Uh, so I don't know if you so oh, I'm glad that he, yes. Holly, I'm sorry. Your phone is breaking up, and a lot of people are commenting on it in the chat box. Is there a... Um, can, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Can you hear me better now? I, I hear you fine now, but um, I just wanted you to know that there were parts where it was dropping out and that people in the... Uh, the comments were mentioning that. So I don't know if you're moving around or if it's, I don't know, I just wanted you to know, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's okay. Um, and and please let me know if uh, if you have problems. I'm, I'm trying to hold the microphone near my mouth, so maybe that's a problem okay. too. Yeah, maybe. Um, uh, okay, sounds okay now, thanks. Okay, great. So, so the, these are the topics we're going to cover today. Um, they're uh, discussed in a lot more detail in the report, so um, I'm just going to gloss through a lot of these. We're going to talk about the project objectives um, that we covered. A lot of those align with um, the, um, the topics that we're going to cover. The panel wanted us to take a look at um, what multi-agency fair payment systems were, procurement and deployment approaches, governance policy and policies, benefits, next uh, data use and analytics, and next generation system. Um, we tried to figure out a way to, uh, to normalize the cost information, but because it was, each system was so different, it was difficult to do that, so we didn't collect any kind of cost information. Um, so, usually the syntheses are composed of three different sets of activities. A comprehensive literature review, uh, which covered both electronic fare payment as well as multi-agency fare systems. Uh, we conducted a survey um, where, uh, and what we found was somewhat surprising. There were only 27 regions in the U.S. and Canada that were multi-agency. Um, UTA, for example, is a single agency. In that region, there's, there's only uh, one uh, transit system. Um, so something like that, which is a, a multi, which is a large metropolitan area, wasn't included in this study. 
Uh, we had an 85% uh, response rate to the survey. And then we uh, performed several case examples. We wanted to take a look at account-based systems. Uh, we wanted to take a look at non-traditional partners. Mike identified those as some of the next generation systems. But we also wanted to take a look at data management and analytics and what kind of data uh, can be extracted and, and uh, created from FAIR data. Uh, the research period, which is important um, because of all the changes in the last year, was from November 2015 to May 2016. Um, so I'm, I'll start first on the, the history of, uh, of the, these multi-agency fair collection systems. Um, the most comprehensive histories are found in the TCRP reports from 1996 to 2015. It's interesting to note that many of today's innovations that, or what we uh, perceive of as innovations were actually piloted in the period between 1999 and 2006. Uh, that includes using credit card on board to, to board a bus. Um, it includes uh, leveraging um, leveraging um, um, the card to be able to purchase uh, uh, retail information, uh, retail uh, at retail stores, and so on. And um, but what's also interesting is that many of these um, many of these um, Pilots are no longer operational, um, so that 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 is probably because they were deployed before their time. Um, we also did a literature search on um, some of the new mobile ticketing systems and payment systems out there, and what we found that was um, between. Um, the 2012 until last year, 2015, um, there were, last year, I should say, there were double the number of deployments as there was in the first four years. Um, in, uh, the other thing to note is that in the five years from, um, of the, these deployments that we looked at, there were more mobile ticketing deployments then in the 25 years of the multi-agency uh, systems that were deployed. Most of the, these systems are single agency systems. We also took a look at benefits. We asked the respondents of the survey about uh, what they were looking for. And what we found is that in uh, previous reports, the responses today are the same as they have been in the last 15, 18 years. Um, agencies are looking for seamless regional travel, uh, reduction in, in fare collection costs, improved customer service, uh, the ability to create loyalty programs and apply new marketing strategies, improved data collection, uh, additional data uh, collection and analytics, uh, fair policy flexibility, but that should, that's there's an interesting um, uh, twist to the fair policy flexibility later on that we learned, as well as equity for all the regional partners in a regional system. Um, we, the next thing uh, the panel wanted us to look at is the, the governance models and the business models. So who makes the decision in these multi-agency systems? Mike talked a little bit about that. Um, in the early periods, and even today, usually the large transit agency makes the, in the most significant investment and supports smaller transit agencies in participating in this. They usually make the decisions, um, and uh, the smaller agencies live with most of those decisions. 
The, the next model, the Regional Transit Authority, um, is an organization that leverages planning dollars and rolls out the system for all its constituent agencies. So MTC, the uh, Bay Area Metropolitan uh, Transportation Commission is an example of, of that organizational model, uh, that governance model. In, there's only one uh, model that's a peer-to-peer -peer in the U.S., and that's the ORCA system in the Puget Sound. And there, each agency has one vote, and they all take turns leading the uh, the, the regional um, uh, electronic payment system. Um, what all these models, what all the the participants of these models say, is that the models can only work well when there's trust, transparency, and communications among all the members. So it doesn't matter if it's a lead agency or a regional authority or a peer-to-peer -peer environment, that's, the, uh, that's what makes the models work. That's what makes the approach work. Um, in addition um, to governance, we looked at the business models, so how are the the services and the infrastructure um, organized. Is it shared? Is it independent? Um, and what we found was that there's a, a mix out there. There's many of the regional systems have a shared infrastructure. That's where a significant amount of the startup costs are um, in building that infrastructure out. Um, but they share services like media branding. So you have the Orca card, you have the Clipper card, you have the TAP card. Um, they have uh, either the same fare and transfer policies or different transfer, fare and transfer policies. Some of the, those systems, the systems allow for multiple uh, policies. Uh, sales channels, where they sell the uh, the cards and how they sell the cards and customer information. Um, equipment monitoring is another area. Usually that's independent. Data analysis, that's usually uh, independent as well. Um, there are the models that um, you can see three examples of models over here uh, where you have uh, hybrid infrastructure. Um, the onboard equipment is owned by the agencies, but the back office equipment is leveraged as a central system and common. Um, in some cases, you will have uh, common services, um, and in other cases, uh, independent services. There are uh, two additional models, and this is that's typical, this hybrid, common, hybrid services. There's the independent uh, infrastructure and service, which is, uh, I've only seen one of those where you have the same infrastructure stood up in two different regional systems, and they share information in the back office. They have the same media, uh, the same card, so that um, the card information can be transferred between them and a user can use their card on either of the systems. Uh, a, a new approach to um, that has been deployed recently, and that's more characteristic of these mobile ticketing systems, is the platform or payment as a service, where you might have common infrastructure, but you have independent services. So for example, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation initiated a project called Bus Plus, where they use the same infrastructure, the same uh, vendor has the supports uh, cloud service, and each of the um, commuter buses systems that participate in this has their own uh, payment system, their own fare uh, policies, uh, their own services, um, but they use basically the same platform. Um, we took a look at the, we asked the respondents to the survey what the challenges were 
uh, to, in implementing these uh, different business models. And uh, these were organized, we organized them into or categorized them uh, into several types of responses. The first being relationship building. Trust and communications, like I said before, was the most important and probably the most uh, uh, often stated uh, issue or comment that that people have uh, that the respondents uh, communicated. Um, by the way, the what is in italics is actually the actual responses from the survey. Consensus building was another issue that was brought up. Um, decisions take a long time, um, and trust and respect is is one of the issues related to making these business models work. Um, I mentioned before about fair payment of fair uh, structure complexity. Well, many of the organizations said that um, the complexity is is an obstacle to making the systems work well and deploying the systems. That the if you simplify your fair structures or if you identify what all the business rules are before the deployment, the deployments and the uh, business models are much easier to uh, to implement. And finally, there's more than just these four, but I wanted to bring up these four, the governance and financial decision-making issues, um, and also dollars are, are really one of the other things that uh, have had, that came up. Um, we also identified uh, procurement and asked about procurement and deployment strategies. What we found was that the models that were developed by um, other studies align with what we're looking at as well. So the Smart Card Alliance, which is uh, now uh, has a different name to it, uh, the Secure Technologies Council um, or Alliance, um, wrote this, the, the Transportation Council there wrote this paper in March of 2010 where it identified different ways of contracting and procuring these kinds of services. What is notable is that the system manager or, or what we now call system integrator and design build approach has really taken over as the major way of uh, deploying these technologies. Um, and there's some really good discussion in there about what they are. What we found was that a lot of the ways, the, the strategies that agencies have identified, why they took, why they selected the approach they did was based on avoiding risk. So for example, to avoid vendor lock-in, they selected a multiple vendor uh, equipment procurement in order to make sure that they, their multiple contractors didn't point the finger at each other, they hired a system integrator. Uh, in order to avoid technology obsolescence, because a lot of these programs, what we found took five to 10 years to deploy, um, because they're deployed over time, especially when you have a large number of uh, partner agencies wanting to uh, join in. So a lot of their approach to deal with technology obsolescence was to do a big bang or deploy the whole system at the same time. Um, so in um, TCRP report 115, they looked at the, the rollout and how to the typical systems were deployed. And um, what they found was that there are about four different ways of doing this, um, rolling out with participants, rolling out with technology and functionality um, by um, um, early adopters. Um, and also then there's that big bang. And what you can see in this model from uh, the report was that there are a few takers of the Big Bang, and that's because 
many of these systems don't work when you try to roll out a very large, complex regional project at, in one, uh, you know, in one bang. Um, and we see that also in lessons learned from some of the agencies who try to take a similar kind of approach. Um, so the the comments that different agencies who took different approaches made uh, with respect to turnkey or or DBOM systems um, that was many of the early uh, adopters of these multi uh, agency systems uh, used the turnkey system and. They used it because that's how big complex projects were uh, deployed at that time and procured at that time. Um, may not hold true right now. Uh, certainly uh, agencies like to have somebody who's accountable and so they want to have one vendor. Um, and so many systems now look to the newer systems uh, hire a system integrator with multiple, and the system integrator either brings in the uh, multiple vendors or they procure them later, but they're still responsible to make sure that uh, the system actually works. Uh, what a lot of transit agencies we've seen or these regional projects that we've seen, uh, the agencies have money um, over a, a period of time and so they act themselves as a system integrator integrating Fairbox or mobile apps uh, later on and they bring in separate contracts to do that. They don't always work out as that um, comment says integrating various vendors with different agendas and timelines fell to the agency and has been a monumental challenge. Um, and I, I think a lot of agencies see that as uh, uh, difficult to do. Uh, most of these systems have some kind of pilot, and um, that's been recommended by almost everybody across the board. And in some cases, there have been public-private partnerships, uh, typically not with these complex systems, but in many cases, uh, it's um, with uh, mobile ticketing, mobile apps, um, there's more of a, a public-private partnership capability or um, uh, that that agency, that vendors have uh, promoted. Okay. So I'm going to talk about data management and analytics now. That was one of the areas we wanted to cover because there's a lot of literature on um, how fair data is used, that there's a richness to the the data that could be used to generate planning and operational uh, information to improve transit service. Uh, but little has been written on uh, data quality, data validation approaches, uh, data management, and how to integrate the data over time with other sources. And so we went to uh, Washington Metro, um, LaMata, to their business intelligence group and we talked to them about their management process, the cleaning, validation, and merging process, and merging with other, fusing the data with, with other data. They've been doing this for uh, over 15 years. They're the longest multi-agency electronic fare payment system out there, so we thought they would be uh, a good organization to talk to. Um, their what they, their uh, lesson to everybody is that the data um, cleaning is based on ensuring that the data are consistent, complete, and correct. Um, you have to understand the meaning of the data, and to do that, you need a knowledgeable data customer um, who knows what they want. Uh, you need to understand the test and validate the 
uh, the data in a repeatable process so that the data is consistent over the long term and the long period that you want to use it for. Um, and then you can stage the data effectively. There's more details in the report on how they do this. Um, I just wanted to bring highlights of, of uh, their lessons learned here. Um, and you can see that there's a difference between um, operational data and intelligence. In most cases, the typical data collection by organizations uh, may include uh, raw ridership information like you have in Chicago on their website uh, for people to download, um, or you have ridership information you know, for each agency uh, over time. But what you see with some of the WMATA data is that they could pull up five years of data and apply it in the same way over time and know that it's consistent and they could parse it uh, as they need to in order to show uh, the information. So here what you have is five-year history of ridership which is, and you could pull down the graphic, um, but you can see what the ridership uh, levels were from uh, Sunday through Saturday every single week for five years. You can see where the snowstorms were uh, because there are low, some of the, the orange on some of the days, um, or you can see when um, the inaugurations were because of the high ridership on weekends, for example. Um, the other thing that they were able to do is show what the frequency of use was in AM, midday, PM, and evening peaks um, by the types of riders that, uh, that rode on the buses during that time. You could only do this if you have consistent data. If you can go through that data and track by uh, certain parameters. And they set up their data management system so they could actually go and grab that kind of information. I have a really nice blog, the planners, that you can go to and, uh, and pull down their research as well. Um, so the finally, Similar to uh, what the TCRP report 177, we wanted to take a look at next generation and accounting systems. And I uh, want to go back to Mike's uh, model, the model presented in, in 177. Um, we show the multi-agency standards-based, account-based, and then the hybrid solution with closed payment and open payments. Um, what characterizes these, like Mike said, was processing, all the processing and transactions occur in the back office. Um, and it's done in near real time. Um, one of the other features that characterize this, these kind of systems is you have one account. A traveler has one account, but they can use multiple media. And what's notable here is that the media can be agnostic, um, could be anything, as long as it's based on the standards that are uh, approved that can be read by the reader and uh, processed by the back office. The first multi-agency electronic uh, payment system uh, open payment system was Ventra in the Chicago area. Um, we wanted to take a look at what the challenges were um, in deploying these kinds of systems, but we also wanted to go at, to go back to what uh, the panel wanted to look at was why is it so hard to deploy these systems? Um, and so we interviewed the um, uh, project manager over there, as well as numerous other uh, people associated with the project, and um, identified some of the lessons learned 
um, which really comprise a roadmap that answers that panel's question of why is it so hard, at least with respect to the deployment strategy. Um, and you can see some of the models that were discussed earlier um, move, uh, apply also to these lessons learned. Um, and so it just reinforces the uh, the models and the you know the the reasons why people should read these reports because there's good information about what you should avoid. Um, one of the first things is that migrate users uh, in small communities, especially with new technologies where they don't behave in the same way that that um, older technologies that current technologies work. Uh, when you move from, for example, uh, contact um, bank cards or back office transactions or mobile uh, uh, NFC-based transactions, uh, they are going to behave differently than what the current technologies do. Um, and so if you use smaller communities, you can, um, especially early adopters um, of technologies, then they're more tolerant of some of the glitches that may occur. They know that that's what they're going to face. Um, but that also means you have to let them know, and from their experience, you have to let other people know once you open it up to larger communities what the changes in their behavior uh, need what changes in their behavior need to occur. So, for example, the transactions don't happen in 200 to 300 milliseconds. They happen in 700 milliseconds, which is an eternity when it when you're waiting for your tap to be validated. Um, the other thing that they mentioned uh, is that testing. You never can do enough testing. These are software-driven systems. Uh, and communication-driven systems, and they are new enough that um, that the glitches haven't been figured out yet. There's not a maturity in a lot of these systems, although uh, since we've deployed, since, since the study's been written, there have been uh, additional deployments in the industry for account-based systems. Um, so there's more maturity now than there was a year ago, but still there's there's not a whole lot of maturity out there. And um, don't take away customers' comfort level until you know for sure that the new system is going to work without a glitch. Uh, so decommissioning the old system should only occur once all the problems are fixed with the new system. One of the other uh, the new trends that uh, people are moving towards, and, and um, Mike uh, talked about this uh, briefly as well, is uh, integrating non-traditional mobility services with these fare systems. One of the earliest approaches um, and earliest uh, implementations was the Metro Express Lanes uh, Transit Rewards Program where the express lanes and LA tap cards were um, linked so that the if you took several trips on uh, LA tap along the corridor, then you would get a credit for uh, for using the uh, the HOV lanes or the the uh, uh, the tap lanes the the um, Hot links. So um, there, this is an example of a uh, one account multiple media implementation where the tap card ID was linked to the uh, trans transponder ID and uh, the benefits from one account was sent over uh, to the other account uh, to provide the uh, to provide the um, the credits, um, there have been there are a lot. This was a, a post processing 
implementation. Today, there are more real-time implementations that are occurring, um, and part of that is occurring through the Mobility on Demand sandbox that the FTA has implemented. Um, and I think that we're going to see a lot more of these in the future. At this point, this concludes my uh, presentation. I want to thank you all. Uh, you can find the um, oh, too bad it's not there. You can find the um, reports at the TRB website. You can download these reports from there. And uh, at this point, if there are any questions, I want to turn this back to Lori so she can handle any of the questions. Um, operator. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, your question and answer session will now begin. If you wish to ask a question, please keep star then 1 on your telephone, record your name, and press the pound key. If you then decide to withdraw your question, simply key star 2. All questions will be answered in the order received, and you'll be advised when to ask your question. All other lines will remain on listen only. Just to remind you, if you wish to ask a question, Please press star then 1 on your telephone, record your name, and press the pound key. So we'll just wait and see if anyone is dialing in with questions. Um, Lori, we, yeah. Lori we've, had, we've had several questions um, while, the, while Polly was presenting. Um, yeah. people, people were asking about who runs the clearinghouse and how does that work? Um, explain it's usually run by a private systems integrator on, under contract to transit authorities or, or the uh, local MP, regional MPO that's running the payment system. Um, people are asking about applicability of payment systems on paratransit. And we had a good dialogue there where people are saying it's it's not usually the same media because they don't have the reader technology, but um, it 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 could be things like mobile ticketing could be, and mobile apps could be used on paratransit, and you could link paratransit accounts on the back end. Uh, and somebody was asking if you don't have a smartphone, how do you contact some of these services, and I, I mentioned that concierge services are now being developed um, which allow you to contact them without a smartphone and essentially make a reservation for a ride. And you can also pay for your travel to, and mo with most of them without a bank account. Okay. Edward asking, yeah. were there any yeah. studies conducted outside of North America and lessons learned? Uh, Polly, you've seen a lot of the international work, right? Yeah, so um, the, the um, European and Asian systems run a little bit differently. Most of those are government uh, based centralized government based in the U EU there are they develop standards and uh, transit agencies are required to uh, abide by those standards um, in Asia for example uh, Korea has a single fare system Japan has uh, several but they have standards that they've developed and so all the agencies adopt those standards um, and there are different uh, equipment vendors that support those kinds of standards. They're even developing in a payment app for all of the uh, PACRIM com country countries. Um, so most of the uh, uh, in Asia as opposed to the U.S. Um, so those that's so it's don't it's different than it is here in the US where the the government structure doesn't require adoption of standards to implement uh, these systems. Um, it, I guess there was one question about equity issues related to people without smartphones. Um, a lot. So in those cases, the debit cards or the prepaid cards are provided to 
um, to users of SEPTA, although not a multi-agency system, um, has a smart card that um, that they can buy, and it's also a uh, multi-use card. When they use it for transit, they have a transit purse on there that um, they're not charged uh, for putting money on their transit purse, although they could put money on their uh, regular retail purse, and then the charges apply. So that's a way of uh, managing those kinds of equity issues, although most people uh, who are low income or in income have some kind of smartphone, and uh, many people do their banking on smartphones these days. And uh, Jennifer asked if there are any mid-sized agencies that have gone open and account-based, and um, uh, Utah Transit Authority was the first in the United States to use that approach. Um, so it is something that uh, 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 virtually any kind of any size agency could adopt. Now, other European models. I mean, the, the the transferability of the European experience really depends on on whether how similar the other factors are. Uh, I mentioned that open payment cards have been very popular in London. Here, they haven't. Uh, because they're not as prevalent, they're just not available to the customers. So you really have to know what is the situation is in your region and adapt it to, to what's going on. Um, in other cases, other parts of the world have demonstrated uh, innovative applications. Some of you may have heard about the mobility as a service app demonstrations um, that took place in Scandinavia. And these were just demonstrations, not full-scale implementation, but it did show how the customers uh, were interested in having an account that could be used for any kind of mobility, transit, ride sharing, car sharing, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, and Faith makes the point that Orca uh, is another example of a, an open uh, uh, system uh, in a mid to large size agency, although that's getting to be a pretty big regional system. No, that ORCA is uh, is actually a closed card based system. So um, there's only you can you have to buy uh, the ORCA standardized card. You can't use a credit card to get onto a bus or onto uh, some transit. They're working on a next generation system that um, will be uh, open payments. I think there are some people from the Seattle area online who um, are participating in that development right now. I saw a few people on the on the list. Uh, we have questions about can a uh, transit system adopt more than one fare system? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, there, there are transit authorities that have smart cards that have mobile payments, um, that accept employer IDs. Uh, if you use the open architecture, it enables you to accept any kind of payment media. And you could have people that have passes, you could have people that pay as you go and use prepaid cards uh, or accounts. Um, there's lots of flexibility if you make it more of an open system. Generally, uh, most people think the account-based system gives you a little bit more flexibility too because you change the fair rules on the back end. Operator, are there any calls, uh, questions online, uh, on the phone line, or no? There are no questions on the phone line. Okay. And Vernon was asking about multimedia on one card. Uh, there are several places where people have used multiple technologies uh, on the same card. Um, the card is, can be used in a contactless mode. They may have a mag stripe. Um, there's uh, technology, smart card technology that has both contact and contactless uh, interfaces, so you could use it. Um, in retail outlets where they only put the contact card uh, or contactless mode. So lots, of, lots of different 
technology combinations. Uh, there's a question from Rupa K. Do you see it? Yeah, have so which ones yeah. have been the most successful? Well, they're they're different, um, and the technology is changing. So you have the uh, when the card-based systems became successful, the new technology, the the account-based systems started um, to gain momentum because they're more flexible, not so much in the the fair policy, but include being able to include additional types of services and mobility services. And so I think what you'll find is that uh, there, the, the, they eventually work, these multi-agency electronic payment systems, um, and that the new systems will also go through their uh, their humps of their challenges of being of making them work, and then they'll be successful as well. The technology isn't a hundred percent there. NFC takes a long time to read at the turnstile or at the uh, fair transaction units, so that's a hiccup, a challenge that has yet to be addressed. Um, there are new technologies like this be in, be out that uh, will also change the way that it'll be more like um, ungated or um, access to buses where you don't have to stand in line and and uh, tap your card or tap your phone. It'll just passively read your, your phone and then you just have to validate that the ticket or that you're boarding the bus or or leaving the bus. There's still problems there, um, so I think there's a lot of challenges left to uh, to do. And um, another report in a, another ten years or five years will illuminate how some of those challenges were addressed. Yes, Sarah, you can get more detail on the B and B out technology uh, from a. Uh, the case study on the Dresden demonstration. Um, so that, that's something you can, you can get online. Um, Pete's asking about whether or not agencies have allowed university students to use their school ID card. Uh, Utah Transit is a good example of that, where several of the local universities have adopted contactless school ID cards. Um, they're all using the ISO standards for contactless cards, so the transit authority can identify who, the owner of that card and link it up with their account that's been established uh, with the transit authority through the university. So uh, Ed mentioned that uh, MIT students use their student ID uh, for the Charlie card, which is in um, the MBTA. Uh, High school students also uh, have IDs that can be used by the MBTA. Typically what they do is they buy the card from the MBTA because it's a proprietary card-based system and it has um, a monthly pass associated with it during the period of the school year so that it could be restricted. So the school buys that and then there's a back office uh, valid uh, card list that supports the uh, access rights of that card. Are there any other questions? It's a question on the line. Would you like to take it? Yeah. The first question we have is from Eric Berkman, Wolfie Center. Please go ahead. Uh, hi there, Mike. Um, I was just curious about the open fair payment systems in relation to um, branding. I know that we had talked before about how a lot of times these regions will really rally around the um, agency branding or the fair card branding uh, in relation to their uh, the systems that participate in that fair card. So. 
I was just wondering if you had heard from any agencies that took that into consideration when implementing an open fair payment system, that they're losing a little piece of control, they're losing a little piece of um, maybe public goodwill by giving up the branding and using media like student IDs or uh, like a toll pass uh, to access a transit system. Uh, I haven't heard a lot of concern about losing the brand because in most of the regions they've also had a transit authority branded card or type of fare media and sometimes or, or sometimes they have a co-branded card. Um, if you look at the cards from Chicago or Philadelphia, uh, they've got a transit authority brand but they may ha also have a financial um, institution um, logo on them as well. So I think the the idea of the open system is that you want to offer the convenience of accepting cards issued by other organizations and there's some potential benefits there too because the transit authority doesn't have to issue those cards. So you might be lo losing a little bit of um, brand recognition because your name isn't on everything, but uh, there could be potential cost savings. Thanks. Now I think Ellen had a question that was kind of piggybacked onto that with cost benefit analysis. Um, there isn't anything in my report related to cost benefit analysis. There are some in some of the other reports that the TCRP reports and I would just point you to those reports and uh, those are all available uh, online so you could download any of those reports. Probably the closest one I think would be the 117 uh, report that was um, that was written back in 2000 and and 14. Yeah, there's, there's also a report by the Secure Technology Alliance, uh, formerly the Smart Card Alliance, uh, on the costs of implementing uh, transit smart card systems. So that's another reference that uh, you, can, you can check out. Uh, David was asking a similar question about how do you justify the upfront costs of installing a new payment system to your board or to the public uh, and there there are lots of different ways agents agencies and region 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 excuse me have, have justified their programs um, some of its cost based uh, implementing technology that they think will have lower maintenance costs uh, will reduce the card issuance costs um, many of them are looking for cost savings in reducing the amount of cash they handle. So handling cash is very, very expensive uh, and the more you can get cash out of the transit system, uh, the more potential savings either with a smart card or, or a mobile device um, or using mobile ticketing. So that, that's, that's been a big driver um, to in, in many places. And then other places have, have um, partially justified the program because it, it um, adds so much convenience to the rider that instead of having to have multiple payment uh, media for all, every system in the region, they're able to use one, one type of media. So there are lots of different ways you can, you can justify the system. Uh, it just depends on the situation in your, in your, in your agency or your region. There's a, another uh, Smart Card Alliance uh, study that was done in 2011 that talked about the benefits of um, of open payment systems. So I there's a reference in the synthesis uh, for that report, and that has some of the benefits uh, for using uh, for transit agencies becoming a merchant or similar to a merchant as opposed to being the banker of these uh, these smart cards. This kind of turns the role of transit uh, around in, the, in that kind of a situation. 
Yeah, the original driver for the open system model was that the transit authority was not going to have to issue all the as much media and they would just be essentially like another merchant. But that really depends on whether the media is being issued by somebody else, which hasn't been the case in the U.S. up until now. Uh, as more and more systems try to go towards open systems, particularly very large ones like New York City, um, that may compel the trans uh, the financial institutions to start issuing more contactless bank cards as they have in places like London. Uh, Amy's asking about trends or information related to transaction fees as a means of paying for your contractor services. And I think maybe the best example that I know about there in the, in the U.S. is in Chicago. Uh, they have an agreement with their their uh, fare collection vendor, Cubic, uh, to supply and operate the Ventra system. I don't know all the specifics of that, but uh, the Chicago Transit Authority would probably be a good source. And the, the point of contact there is Mike Gwynn. T-W-I-N-N. -N. So uh, that's um, characteristic that having the transaction cost versus an operational cost um, is typical of mobile ticketing systems. Um, and that's somewhat different model than the fare collection systems. But many true authorities are considering that kind of a model now where um, they may help with the upfront costs, capital costs, but try to get the, uh, the contractor providing the service to um, bear the O&M costs for the life of the car the system. Do we have other questions online? Yeah. Operator, are there any other calls? The next question we have is from Steve Abinet, MPC. Please go ahead. Hi, that was Jason providing the introduction. I just wanted to ask our speakers if they've seen any evidence. So one model is moving towards open payments as a way of encouraging their more interoperability across regions. Have you seen any evidence of a different model of linking accounts across large regional participants and say accepting each other's credentials or using standards to be able to say uh, accept credentials across programs or is that still not really happening? I haven't seen it between regions, Stephen, um, although I have heard of um, companies uh, trying to issue uh, a, a way or develop and who have developed ways of of delivering people's fair media. Um, there's a small company, a startup that just uh, has just started last year, who are essentially delivering any region's fair media through their mobile app, and that starts to get it what you're talking about. Um, so they would. As we established, as they establish accounts with each of the various regions, and they would more or less translate that into funding that particular media. Is that that, that's what it sounds like. Um, I haven't gotten a whole lot of information not from them because um, they're brand new, but it sounds like that's the arrangement they're they're trying to promote. Interesting. Well, I just. Sorry, Brian, if, if we had better standards of what the media credential looked like, we could maybe fairly easily support with accounts some sort of inter-regional settlement process. Um, anyway, just an idea. Or it could be a back office, similar yeah. to what the Express Lanes and, and LA Tap did. Exactly, because I, I guess the model that that's happening kind of in, in the tolling world, they're trying to kind of work towards that. and. Yeah. It's also kind of banking with the idea of, you know, token vaults and some of these other concepts. And Tolling yeah, actually has been doing that for a very long time. I could, uh, dr with my easy pass transponder, I could drive up and down I-95 on the East Coast to any state and, uh, and use it. But it's not real time, so every night they 
transfer the charges to uh, the organization where the the toll was taken um, and uh, and then are able to charge my account so a lot of these kinds of systems don't have because there are no standards out there um, they're really a post-processing type of implementation at this point which doesn't always serve the customer if they don't have enough money in their account or serve the agency if there's not enough money in the customer's account to pay for the, the fare. Okay, and, the other kind, and then Stephen, as, as, as we've discussed in the past, uh, the other kind of account linkage that we see happening um, is between different types of mobility. So uh, several regions are exploring linking their transit account with a bike share account or a car share account, um, and that may may uh, evolve into essentially regional mobility accounts, which could could potentially go outside of an individual region and be a more widespread kind of mobility account. Do you have any? Are there any? Sorry. Did you have an example of that, Mike? Michael? Uh, Not between regions, but certainly in um, in w within regions, uh, transit agencies are developing some multimodal arrangements, um, particularly be between transit and bike share. Um, they're uh, in places like Los Angeles. They're talking about linking their their transit account with a, a bike share account. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think LA Cab actually in Los Angeles they've they've linked their bike share and uh, their transit accounts. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions, but we are nearing the 90 minute mark. Um, operators, or anyone else in the queue? There's no more questions on the line. Um, Lori, we have we have one um, from Miguel about uh, the Smart Cities Initiative and mobility okay. on demand, and I mentioned real quickly the um, the Federal Transit Administration has a mobility on demand steps program where they've given 11 grants to um, different transit or different regions to try out innovative uh, ways to provide more on demand services of any kind of mobility. And in at least four of those, payment is part of the demonstration. Um, and in their uh, Chicago Transit Authority, for example, is linking their transit and bike share account. So um, there's some. This is definitely part something that could be part of a, a smart cities initiative. Okay. Yes. That's it. We should wrap this up. Any parting words? <laughs> no, I guess um, we we would be happy to uh, work with any of you. If, uh, if you have additional questions, let Polly or, or me, Mike Denning know, um, and and we will be happy to try to follow up. Um, the I think there are, there, there are going to be some really exciting opportunities in the future, particularly as we get into multimodal payments and mobility. Polly? Uh, and I just, uh, I think we're in for a roller coaster and uh, change um, over the next five years, and it's going to be very exciting and uh, to see what what happens. The technology is just moving forward very quickly, and and the cost of many of these systems, even though they're complex, are going down. So thank you. All right. I guess that's it, everyone. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating this afternoon. A very special thank you to Mike and Polly for your great presentations. Um, as a reminder, everyone should be receiving an invitation to fill out an evaluation for this event. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you took some time to fill that out. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback. Thanks, everybody.